joining me here. I am uh, fighting a sore throat, so I do apologize. I do sound a little wonky. Um, my topic is from Archeo to Archivex. Um, my name's Abby. I'm a cybersecurity consultant with a small firm out in Orange County. I focus in the areas of risk management, vulnerability management, and incident response. My background is actually in digital forensics and e-discovery, but I actually didn't start from a technical or traditional background. Um, so for today's talk, we're going to go over my background. We're gonna, I'm going to build a, establish a foundation of what cybersecurity is and how I made that transition, and then give you two tools that I use to make that, that journey in my journey. So um, a self-assessment and a SWOT. So, I actually was born and, and raised out in Linwood, California, not too far from here. Um, low income community, not a lot of resources available. We had, I didn't grow up with a computer at home, things like that. Um, I went to UCLA to study Near Eastern Archaeology. I had the opportunity to attend the American University of Cairo, and I went on to do my master's at the University College of London, where I focused on managing archaeological sites. My background is really in archaeology. I've worked as an archivist, a cataloger, and an archaeologist throughout the Middle East, throughout Southern California. In, um, in around 2008, 2010, the economy kind of took a big shift, and I found myself unemployed. A lot of the jobs that I held were contract-based, for a limited period of time based on donations, endowments, grants, things like that. So you always were, were kind of hustling to, to make um, sure that you, you had a contract and that you had a job. Um, I found myself unemployed though in 2010 and looking to stay in Southern California, looking for a little bit more a stable career, I started applying to anything and everything that I could find. At the time, I actually found a job for an evidence technician position. I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea what, well, what's an evidence technician. I don't know what kind of firm would hire a person you know, with my skill set, but it turns out they actually wanted somebody with a library background. I, okay, well, we're, gonna, we're gonna go for it. Uh, it turns out that, that that company that was looking was a digital forensics consulting firm, Strauss Friedberg. They're now Aon, they're one of the big players. So if you ever hear Deloitte, KPMG, EY, those were our competitors. That's who we played with, so. Um, throughout my career then, um, I ended up getting my certified uh, GCFE, that's a SAN certification. And then most recently, about two years ago, I got my CISP. So uh, that's where I am now. So, why, why the big shift? Oh, sorry, you had a question? No, I have a question. Yeah. So, your CISP, mm -hmm. can you tell me why you got it and how it's helping you? Sure. Yeah, so I ended up getting the CISP because a lot of my employers wanted that. I've mm -hmm. been in the industry now for 10 years, so that is, at some point in time, if you want to take the next step, a lot of my managers coached me to say, you know, this is the next step in your career. Mm -hmm. Do I want to do that? That's a personal question. That's a journey. I always would prefer to stay in forensics because that's my passion. That's my background. It's more aligned to what I did. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, the CISP is something that hiring managers, at least at, at the higher level, are looking for. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so um, that being one of quite a few uh, certifications in cybersecurity. Did you, not being a technical computer software IT background, did you find the CSISP difficult to study for or no? Or? Not at that point, because I had already been in the industry for a while. Oh. So, so it made sense. Um, but the, 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 the funny part, though, is that the, the domain one and two, so CISSP is divided into eight domains. Some are very technical, some are not as technical. My, my, my weakness, I will be the first to admit it, is actually in risk management. That is not something that I gravitate towards. It's not something 
policy development, right? I, I prefer the technical side. So I struggled on the actually the non-technical things. So so that was that was an interesting experience. Um, so going back though uh, to how does an archaeologist make a jump into cybersecurity? Those two things seem very distinct. They're very different. And I wanted to set up first the foundation of well, what is cybersecurity when we think about it? Okay. So on the one hand, we think techniques to protect the integrity of an organization, security architecture, safeguards to protect that the data against attack, damaged, unauthorized access. Uh, another one, it's we have multiple layers of protection across computers, networks, or data um, to keep it safe. At the end of the day, though, what I've realized is it's about the people. It's, you can forget the tech, it's about the people. You know, the weakest link in your chain is people. If you understand people, then you can start protecting against, uh, you know, protecting the data against that threat, right? And that, that's key, that's a key component. And so, uh, just wanted to establish also what an archeologist does, because I think it's important when you're starting your, your journey, if you're gonna transition to think about what is cybersecurity and what do I do? What do I do, right? So I, I studied the remains of, you know, the study of ancient and human past through material remains. Hey, guess what? I study people. You know, I study how people interact with their world. Hey, guess what? I study how people, you know, when they approach a machine, do they write down their password on a sticky note? What do they do? What, what evidence do they leave behind? And then I analyze artifacts and a variety of techniques, including emerging technologies. AI, that's actually big in, in archaeology now. So being able to identify that, hey, I'm using, I am actually using tech in this different way. I'm applying it in different ways. When you start thinking about that like that, when you start thinking about how you use technology, and then try to navigate that conversation, try to switch it into, well, how can I apply this to cybersecurity? And there are many ways you can apply that to cybersecurity. There are many things, like you don't even have to think about the technical, you can start thinking about the policy permissions, the auditing, being an auditor. Right? There, there are so many careers and career paths that you can follow. Now this is, this is a little bit more on the technical side. There is another, um, there's another graph kind of diagram that I didn't, didn't pull up that I saw recently that actually breaks it even down into, well, there's risk management where you could just, all you do is look in at third party questionnaires. There's, um, there's things about policy analysis. There are people who sit and just look at, at frameworks, like the NIST framework, the cybersecurity frameworks, how those controls can be applied to our environment, things like that. So. So when I tell people about my journey, I, I, I tell them, I, I always ask them like, okay, there are two paths you can take. There's the, what am I good at? And what do I want to do? I took the path of what am I good at? And what that means is that I sat there and I started to identify my current skills and try to apply those to cybersecurity. The second path is, well, what do I want to do? Right now, the big one is, hey, I want to be a pen tester. Great, you want to be a pen tester. Do you know how to get there, right? So these are two different distinct paths that when, when, my, ment when I, my mentee's saying, well, I want a job in cybersecurity. Great, what does that look like, right? That's something that, that you have to do a little, a little self-reflection there. So what am I good at? For me, the first step I did was a basic, basic skills assessment. I divided up my skills into my core skills and my unique skills, okay? Your core skills, those aren't dependent on the job. Those don't matter what, what job you have. Those are, okay, they're, they're communication and documentation. Hey, I'm good at communicating with people. What does that mean? That means that I can, when I read, when I send a professional email, there are no typos, there's no grammar. I'm good at documentation, right? I'm good at, at being able to walk into a room, start taking notes, and be able to remember that next time a, a manager or my team needs help. Um, 
Let's see, what else? Soft skills. I'm flexible. I'm adaptable. I'm a team player. You know, being an archaeologist, you're in the field for six weeks with people you've never met, sometimes people you've never showered with. Sometimes you are cranky. You will wake up at 6 a.m. or if not earlier because, so I worked in the desert. I worked in Egypt. You don't want to be out there when it's, it's hot. You don't want to be there in the middle of the day. So guess what? We are up before sunrise. Talk about a team player. I once was on a site, There's no, there was no hot water. No hot water. So you, you, you got to do what you got to do. You got to be flexible. You got to make sure you get your bucket of water out in the morning. Leave it out so that by the time you come home, the sun has already kind of like warmed it up and you have a shower. Right? You're not sleeping on a bed for six weeks in the middle of the desert. You, you have a tent and sometimes the cows will come and hey, right? So you have to show your, you know, that's a soft, that's a, that's a core skill. I'm flexible, I'm adaptable. I can adapt to my environment. I can, you know, I'm working on an international team. There are people here from different cultures, from different experiences that I've never met. Um, general technological skills. Uh, I, I consider, uh, basic troubleshooting from a computer, understanding how you can troubleshoot a computer, understanding Office, a very core skill. There are surprisingly a lot of people who do not know how to use Excel and very basic features, but I think that is a core skill. If you have that, it, highlight that, right? Can you, because that's one thing that is an entry level in cybersecurity, they're gonna ask you, okay, well, can you tell me what would you do if you notice, if you plugged in, for example, a USB device and it's not appearing, what would you do, right? Some of these are questions to understand your thought process. What is your, how would you troubleshoot that? Would you go to Google? Would you give up? Would you go to your, you know, your, your colleague? Would you try to go to your disk manager or your, you know, device manager to identify whether or not one of your drivers is not working? Things like that. How, did you update your machine? So those are, those are things like that that I would, I would highlight. Now unique skills, going back to our skills assessment, are, are tied to a specific role. Those are things that only you, you can do in, your, in, in the current role that you are. For me, uh, Boolean searches and mark records and any type of kind of like database searches, that was a, a very unique skill to, to my skill set when I started applying for careers in, in, in um, cybersecurity. And the reason I mention that is... What are MARC records? MARC records are a special type of language that's used in a library. So, for archivists? For archivists, yeah, and catalogers. So the reason I mention that, understanding how to do these types of searches and why they're very unique skills, because they are tied to the library, but if I step away, I can able, I'm able to say, hey, guess what? I understand languages. I understand how to perform searches. Splunk is a big tool in cybersecurity, and one of the big things, overarching things, is do you know how to set up a query? If I were to give you a database and I asked you, I need you to identify a computer that was on our network, are you going to be able to, to formulate a query? Can you, do you know how to create a search? And that's a basic thing that translates any career, any, any type of technology, right? That's technologic technology independent. And then the next one is just relevant skills. So once you have your bucket of core skills and unique skills, now you really have to think about, so what is relevant to the job that I'm looking for? What is relevant to that? In my case, it was, I'm really good at information services, asset management. I didn't really realize that as a cataloger and working in a library, that translates to asset management. And asset management is really big in cybersecurity because you cannot, you can't protect what you don't know is there. So you need to understand how, how that works. Process documentation is another big one. I know there's a couple of people here who are in the manufacturing field. I know that that is really important, process documentation. Report writing. If you're doing incident response or anything like that, they, or even vulnerability management, a lot of the executives are like, okay, well, what happened? Tell me what happened. Give me the basic, the nitty gritty, a report. Give me a quick, quick and, you know, uh, recap of, of the situation. So those are important. Communication and then 
I just left it as technology. It just means that, you know, I'm quick to pick up a, a, a tool, things like that. So you want to start thinking about your relevant skills. Now, the next one is what do I want to do? And this is a big one because a lot of people are like, okay, well, I don't know. I want to be a pen tester. Or I want to be a forensic examiner. I like the SWOT analysis. I use this to this day, not just as, as um, when I identify um, a role I want, but also as a self-assessment. So a lot of times once you get hired, and this goes for any job, you're gonna have performance reviews. I, I'm not good at that. I draw blanks at, well, what are my goals for the next year? I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm okay, uh, sure. Uh, the other thing is in my experience, and, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm, this is my story, and these are two tools that have helped me, are during, a lot of my organizations have gone through restructuring and reorganizations. So a new leader would come in and they're like, okay, I need to assess everybody's skills. I need to identify what value each person brings to the table, and those were their exact words. So the best thing you can do is bring bring something like a self-assessment, a SWOT, and show, well, here are my here are my strengths, here are my here are where I could improve, but these are the opportunities. And this is this one is a big one, especially of, of what is what challenges I might be facing in order to get there. Um, oh, is there anything else I want to mention about that? Because this is this is important. Um, right. So, Kathy, what's up? So, how often do you do the SWOT analysis for yourself? For me personally, mm -hmm. I I. I do it pretty much every year when it comes to performance review time because it helps. It helps identify, it provides a clear target. Mm -hmm. So I try to do that at least, yeah, every year. Okay. It doesn't have to be every, every year. It can mm -hmm. be however you feel like, but this is just a tool that I use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, the SWAT, as you saw, is broken down into four different different categories, four different boxes. I I did it in in the timeline, but really it's supposed to be strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and, and threats. And so your strengths are all all the things that make you stand out, make you who you are. Your expertise, your knowledge in a specific area that can make a big difference. And and I mentioned that one because that's really important. You Management, it sometimes can feel that management is making decisions that you don't understand why, but if you highlight certain things that you think are important, management actually is reviewing that and, and making note of that, right? So sometimes it's good to, to highlight things like that because you don't know what they're thinking. You don't know what business decisions are being made in the back end. Um, I ended up on vulnerability management only because somebody said, hey, she's really good at building a program. I built an e-discovery program. I, I matured it from the bottom up. And that's what they were looking to do for vulnerability management. I had never touched Qualys. I have never, I don't know what vulnerability management was at the time. I didn't understand you know, common vulnerability exploitation uh, rankings, what, whatever that was. But hey, they saw, you know what? We can pivot her because she's good at documentation, she's good at, at process documentation, she's good at writing, she's good at building programs, so we're gonna put her in that field. Hey, who knew? Um, so then, weaknesses. And this one's a hard, hard one, I think, for anybody to identify areas of improvement. And this is another reason why I like the, the SWAT is because performance reviews, when you do that self-assessment, that's one big one. I always struggle with, well, I, I, where could I improve? So if I have this already, I can just pick it from my, from my toolkit and input it into my, my um, performance review. Um, so, and here's another big one. You can put your gaps in qualifications or certifications. So if you say, hey, 
I really want that Security Plus, I want that Net Plus, I want that SISPI, hey, put it there, that, that, that's your weakness right there. So that, that now you can start reporting that to management and say, hey, look, I'm really good at this, but I'm weak in here. So I'm really good at, at understanding security, I'm really good at understanding vulnerabilities in our environment, managing risk, but you know what? I don't have a cert I don't have a security plus or I don't have a CISSP. Okay. The next one, opportunities. So opportunities are just, hey, what's available to me now? You know, LBCC is offering courses in cybersecurity, Coastline Community College. Those are opportunities. Hey, I just, you know, recently there's um, Security Blue Team was offering free courses on digital forensics and vulnerability management. Those are those are opportunities that you sh should take advantage of, in my opinion. It's it's very important um, to to take to identify those opportunities and take advantage of them. But right, the first step is identifying them. Um, and who can support and help me? Who are people in your network that can can push you there and guide you? Okay, let's see. The next one, threats. These are just things that could impede your success, that can make an in, uh, can negatively impact you. So, hey, LBCC is offering this really good course in in whatever it could be, network, cloud. I just saw they have cloud, right? Mm -hmm. They have cloud now. It's like, but the, they only offer the classes during the middle of the day, right? I have to be at work. That those are things like that is a threat. Um, lack of support from professional or personal network. And once you start visualizing that, now you can start making actions or setting up a plan to how to, how to overcome, how to take advantage of the over opportunities to lessen your threats and improve your weaknesses. That's the whole point of the tool. The tool is to visualize what, what is out there and how can I improve and, and make an impact on my career. Are there any questions on that? No? We're good? Okay. We're good. So, um, other things that are, yes, Mario. So, in lots of ways, you, so you mentioned you do the SWOT analysis like once a year before your review, but at least for the people in the room that are trying to get in the industry, it seems like it's a good tool that you might as well do for, to prepare for your interview. It is an absolutely great tool to prepare for your interview. Yeah, that's right. Because some of the questions they're going to ask you are some of these soft skills, like what are your weaknesses? Uh, a big one that uh, everyone, I, I think oh, everyone always struggles is, um, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, right? And I think when you start highlighting that your strengths in there, that that you come off like a stronger candidate. So definitely also good if you're <coughs> looking to break into the field. Good point. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Was there a point in time where you felt like your strengths or yeah. your strengths and your weaknesses because you were coming from a background that you didn't have as much of the technical? Did you feel like your weaknesses outweighed your strengths or you had like a lot of gaps compared to like your peers or where you were trying to move to? Yes, absolutely. A lot of the time when I first started out, I felt like my weaknesses, because I didn't have that technology foundation, were, uh, were much larger than my, than my strengths. I felt um, I had to do a lot of catch up. So this is um, why opportunities for me were so important, because I tried to seek those out and take advantage of them. Um, a lot of, I still do. To be honest, I, there are times where I feel I cannot speak on e-discovery or forensics, and, and it's just okay. Well, how do I keep my skills fresh? And I think that's important. It's important to for any anybody to um, seek out opportunities and, and and try to take advantage of them. That's why they're there. So. So it doesn't go away. I mean, at least for me, it didn't. It, it still hasn't gone away. So. Um, but yeah. Do you feel like after time went on, your strength started, like your gap started closing, you started being able to speak the 
Lingo and mm -hmm. you know when people are talking some stuff they can like totally flying off of you, over your head. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 I say I don't share this story a lot, but I think it's important to highlight this story. So when I was first starting out in my career, I had never heard the word Linux pronounced. <laughs> I'd never heard Linux pronounced. I had always just read it. And so I'm here I'm in the lab. It's, I, I, I think, a couple of the, uh, months into my new job working with this team. And I say, hey, is, is, I'm really eager to learn Linux. Mm. And everybody's oh. like, what? What? <laughs> what is that? It's like, isn't it Linux, right? Right? It's that language, that Linus person. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, no, Abby, no, Abby, <laughs> Linux. So, you know, so, you know, I, 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 I owned it. I was like, yeah, okay, well, I had only read it in, in online. I've never heard it pronounced, but hey, you know, you, you live and you learn and you try, but that's the point, right? You gotta try, you gotta put yourself out there. You gotta, you gotta, um, you know, I say, these are some other tools that I do. You gotta network, right? Cause that's how people, if you were at the last panel, they mentioned about passion, about what do you like to do, right? Because somebody, I don't want to be a pen tester. I know a lot of people want to be a pen tester. I don't want to be a pen tester. I, I enjoy forensics. I enjoy just sitting behind logs and reading logs and just, yeah. But there are a lot of people who want to do pen testing. Great, that's their passion, right? So the next question is, okay, what are you doing to get there, right? So, yeah. In conjunction with that, so pen testing versus forensics. Forensics are generally post-incident. Right. So is that really where your focus is then? Yeah, my focus is, is post, um, post-incident. post Primarily, though, my background is in internal investigations. Mm -hmm. So I work closely with legal and HR. Right. Um,